Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is you, not a Ukraine war video at all. This is a UK election political analysis uh, video. And I'm doing this because A, I'm deeply interested in this kind of stuff. And B, hopefully it's useful for you to understanding, if you particularly if you're not from the UK, how our electoral system works and what the, the latest electoral results from local elections mean going forward into the general election that will happen possibly November time this year or autumn this year. And then if you're interested in Ukraine, you know how that might or might not affect geopolitical topics like support for Ukraine. I mean, the TLDR, that is nothing really should affect support for Ukraine as far as I can tell. So we have wide bipartisan support for uh, the Ukrainians in that conflict. So there is that. But uh, there is also a lot to be discussed concerning this topic and how it relates to voting in the US. So if you're a US voter or interested in US politics, there might be something to glean about that from this. So we're going to talk a little bit in general about you, the UK political scene, the UK political landscape, before going into what the local elections just told us. Um, and I, hopefully I'll be as fair, like I have my own political opinions, but I don't really, I'm not interested in uh, you know, shouting about them at the moment. I'm just more interested in what we can understand about our own system and what this will tell us about the general election going forward. Now, I will cast my opinion that the voting system in the UK is definitely suboptimal and that is the same system that is used in the US and that is suboptimal. It is, I think, the the poorest form of of democracy or poorest form of voting in a in a democratic system. And there's no surprise that this first pass of vote, the first pass the post voting system, is only really used in Britain and British colonies, former colonies. Uh, that actually any new you know, place like Australia that took on a new voting system, any new voting system that turns up around the world, I think in the last, I don't know, I can't remember the stats, but it, in the last however many decades, 100 years or whatever, no one has taken on first past the post as a preferred voting system, which means that when you just sit down and say, right, we've just got a new country, we've just got a new political system, how? what's the best way of representing our voters in government? And first past the post voting system is not the best way. And just the, the clearest understanding of this is that in any uh, constituency in the UK, in the UK, we have 650 uh, constituencies that make up the country. It looks like that at the moment. That's the 2019 election. And what you can see here is that it looks overwhelmingly blue, overwhelmingly conservative. It, it's reversed from the US here. So the blue is the right wing, the red is the left wing. Uh, and yellow up here is the SNP, the Scottish National Party. Green is Plaid Cymru, the Welsh uh, sort of National Party. And then these kind of orange yellows are Liberal Democrats. And I'll explain where they sit on the spectrum in a, in a wee while. But there are, although it wasn't equal, actually, this is what it looks like if you equalise these constituencies by um, just by saying that each constituency has the same uh, shape, same size. Because what happens is these red uh, constituencies are very densely populated. So you'll find that Labour, the left wing, does much better in... Um, in urban areas that are very densely populated. So you've got uh, Birmingham, you've got uh, Liverpool, Manchester, you've got sort of Newcastle, some of these really big Leeds and whatnot, really big um, urban areas. And London, of course, you've got Cardiff, Newport, that have many, many constituencies that are tiny, geographically tiny, but very population dense. And the, the larger constituencies are very sparsely populated will end up being conservative. They are more rural or very much suburban uh, population areas. And when you equalise it, it looks like that. So this is London. <laughs> That's London as uh, if you put it on an equal size to every other constituency. Uh, and you can see that actually, yeah, it's a lot more equal now uh, than, than that map. Anyway, 
we're talking about first past the post. So what happens is uh, you have, say, and we can look at the election results from the 2019 election to give us a good idea of this. So let's take, well, first of all, we go back to a constituency. Let's take a constituency. Uh, anyone here, let's take, I don't know, West Dorset here. So West Dorset has uh, a, um, at the moment, oh, well, we won't look at that. So it, it has a, an electorate. 100% is everyone voting. And what you can have in any given constituency, so West Dorset could have the situation where 35% of the people voted for the Conservative candidate, 30% of people voted Labour, and 25% of people voted Lib Dem. Uh, so that's now 35, 30, 65, 25, 80, 90, and 10% voted Green, right? Because the person that got the most votes was a Conservative candidate, uh, only 35% of the vote, they get to be the Member of Parliament for that constituency. What that also means is that the majority of people in that example did not vote for that person. So when you talk about some people say, well, it's 50 plus one it's not. That's only when you're talking about making the majority party to rule the whole country. And if you don't get over 50 percent, then you had to form a coalition government. But in a constituency, you only need to be the 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 candidate that got the most votes and that can still be a, a very you could have this weird situation where there are so many parties that the biggest uh, voting chunk was 11 percent or something like that and you could still be representing 100 percent of the people and in the example i gave the the conservative mp or, or candidate got 35 percent of the vote and 65 percent of the people didn't vote for that person which means the majority of the people you you could have this situation that where the majority of the people do not want that person to represent them, but that person gets to represent them because they got the biggest uh, number of votes by comparing to uh, all the parties against each other. And that is therefore not very representative because 65% of those people are not then represented in. So that MP is then voted in and goes to Parliament in, in London and is because we have a represented democracy. They represent West Dorset as a constituency in Westminster in the House of Commons in London. And they make decisions on behalf of West Dorset. But actually 65% of the people in West Dorset didn't want that person. So the majority of the people don't get represented and what's worse is those votes are then thrown away those 65 percent of the votes are like we're not even going to think about them anymore the only way they could have any kind of power those votes those people are essentially disenfranchised the only way they have power is if uh the the parliamentarian who gets voted in there in West Dorset goes, oh, there's quite a lot of people like Lib Dem and Labour around here. I need to cons consider that when I'm thinking about my what policies I vote for, uh, because otherwise next time round, I, I might be close to getting voted out. Of course, someone that has 70% uh, of, of the the electorate in terms of votes will will not bother to think about what the other people, what the other parties are concerned with, because actually they have a massive mandate. That's the only way that the votes get kind of scare quotes used. Otherwise, the votes are essentially thrown away. And this is why first past the post is, is seen as not representative. Um, we can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of first past the post system. You can pause the video, check out the screen. There are some advantages to a first past the post voting system, as in they are they're generally practicalities to do with it's cheaper, easier, quicker, quicker to count. OK, so what if it's not if it's less fair, then who cares whether it takes a little bit longer to count votes where it can have an advantage is localized representation and to do with representative democracy. And because what happens with many forms of proportional representation is your vote goes into a big pot and then gets meted out. And it's a little bit more difficult to work out geographically how that representation works you can work it out on a big national scale and there are ways there are lots of confusing ways of d d complex ways of, of doing this there are many different ways to to do the alternative vote to first pass and post but uh, but the um the disadvantages far outweigh in number and i think of importance uh, far outweigh the advantages of first pass and post and if i was to start a country now i would 
definitely, definitely not do first past the post. It is, it is a, in my opinion, a broken system. The people who generally like it are people from Labour or Conservative because the two main parties are, uh, at, well, actually, SNP are advantaged by it in, in Scotland, interestingly enough. In fact, statistically, they're the most advantaged. But, but um, here, here's an example of how broken it is because, and we'll do a little bit of maths here. So in the 2019 election, this is how the 650 uh, constituencies voted and you had a majority, an outright majority, so that you need 326 to get 50% plus, plus one if you like. Uh, you need 326 uh, constituencies to form a, a majority government. If you get lower than that, it means that there is no majority government and it means that the you have to organise a coalition so different parties can organise a coalition and, and eventually who, whoever, I think the largest party get the, the right to try to sort out a coalition first and then other parties can do that. Uh, and that's what happened in the, in the 2010 election with the Conservative and the uh, Liberal Democrat coalition. Right, now, if we look here, look at Liberal Democrats. Now they got... Uh, what was it? 11.5% of the total of the votes in the UK, and they got 11, um, 11 uh, MPs. Sorry, I was just looking for my calculator that appears to have gone missing. So they got uh, only 11 MPs. Now, if we take 650 and then multiply that by point. 1155 which is 11.55 percent they should have 75 mps so liberal democrats if all of those votes were represented in parliament they'd have 75 mps but they ended up with eight uh, with 11 that's why the liberal democrats absolutely hate first past the post because they all get say uh 11 in each constituency but basically, because 11% is not enough to get them the win in that constituency, those votes are thrown away and they are not represented in Parliament. Only on a rare occasion do they actually become the biggest, uh, have the biggest vote share in, in, each, in any given constituency. Do they get that MP? So let's have a look at the Green Party as well. So the Green Party had 2.61% uh, of the vote. And they got one MP, one MP, 2.61% of the vote. So if we do 650 uh, times 0 0.026, they should have 17 MPs. They have one MP. Uh, this happened with UKIP back in just before Brexit. They had 4 million votes and they got zero MPs. They only got one MP when someone defected from the Conservatives. Doug, Douglas Carswell, he's no longer uh, an MP. But um, it, so the, interestingly enough, when we went for the alternative, I campaigned for the alternative vote in, in that coalition with... So when the Liberal Democrats went into power with the Conservative Party as a coalition in, in 2010... They said we will go into coalition with you if we if we have an uh, an alternative vote referendum in in the population. So that went to a vote, and I campaigned doorstep campaign for alternative vote. And what happened is that the yes to AV alternative vote was winning in the polls, and D D David Cameron realised that uh, as a prime minister at the time realised that the yes vote was winning, and he phoned up four. Uh, of the right-leaning newspaper editors in the country and said, we are losing a vote on alternative... Uh, we're losing a vote on the alternative vote referendum. And that will mean Conservatives and Labour, actually, would lose many, 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 many uh, MPs to the smaller parties. And so we can't have that. So I want you to start campaigning for the no vote tomorrow. So four newspapers then started campaigning and the uh, election and the referendum... The, the polls changed overnight, effectively. And then the referendum took place and the no vote won um, because people were fed a bunch of essentially lies by a bunch of newspapers. And what was really, really quite ironic is that 
when Brexit and many, and I know people who voted Brexit, who voted against alternative vote, didn't really understand alternative vote. Brexit came along or just before Brexit came along when we had the election and the UKIP party who were pro-Brexit party had 4 million votes, as I mentioned, and got zero MPs because they didn't get the majority in any one constituency. And so all of those 4 million UKIP voters, and even though I'm anti-UKIP, I am pro-democratic representation, they had no representation in parliament. And they should have had an absolute, I think they should have had something like 82 MPs and they had zero MPs. And so I know people, I know people in my farm, family that voted against alternative vote, then voted for UKIP and are why didn't we get anyone in? And we're really annoyed. It's like, yeah, because you should have voted for alternative votes. Do you see why it's important now? Because you have no representation and there are no MPs that are UKIP MPs. And and this is this is really important and I'll explain why uh, for, for, for many reasons, but it's, it's, it's really important because it's unfair and these smaller parties are not getting the representation in Parliament. Okay, so there is that. I've talked to you about the constituencies. There's one thing I'm going to say about this. So, okay, as you can see already that we have a situation where your urban areas are going to be much more likely to vote, say, Labour. And then we have an interesting situation with Scotland. Now, first of all, let me just tell you where all the parties, I think, sit on a political spectrum. Now, left, right is too simplistic and it's a bit broken and I prefer the moral compass. But for sort of party aff affiliation or party um, political positioning, let's keep it easy to left, right. OK, and we've got the centre here. So we have the Labour that sit broadly on the left in the UK uh, and you have the Conservatives that sit broadly on the right in the UK. You have the Liberal Democrats who set, sit centre and centre left. I would argue that's where they sit. And you have the Greens that sit further to the left. So, for example, they were the first party in the UK to openly come out and say there should be a ceasefire in Gaza. And they were against what Israel were doing and against our military support for Israel. So the Greens were very strong on that. And as a result, they've actually picked up some protest votes in the local council elections for that would have otherwise gone to Labour. Interesting. We'll come on to that in a second. And then here we've got this new party that is the new version of UKIP. UKIP became the Brexit party after the 2016. And then the Brexit party became essentially Reform or Reform UK, Reform Party. Uh, they are headed by a chap called Richard Tice. And they, I would argue, operate on the uh, further to the right end of the political spectrum. I think that there's many of the things... <laughs> They have an interesting number of candidates who have some very interesting, colourful views. Uh, some of them are, I'm trying not to be too overtly uh, subjective and colour this with my own political opinion, but it is empirically the case that they have a number of candidates who are anti-vaxxers, conspiracy theorists, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got a, that. That's a kind of positioning, very, very much a populist party sitting on the, on the right there. So that that, and then you have the local party. So we go back to our map of the UK. I'm not going to talk about Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland does not have Labour and Conservative. They have like Sinn Fein and and a bunch of other parties that are, are completely different from the UK. And Sinn Fein, uh, so that's SF. These dark green areas. They are, do not come and sit in Westminster. So they refuse to come and sit in the hall, corridors of power in, in, in London. Uh, there's a devolved parliament there. There's a devol devolved parliament in, but it's not been operational. It kind of shut down because of arguments. There's a devolved parliament in Holyrood in Scotland and a Senate in uh, Wales as well. And that was all part of the devolution process during the Labour government from 1997 onwards. Now, so we're going to forget Northern Ireland, but we will talk about Scotland and Wales because it's super important. So there are two nationalist parties, Plaid Cymru in Wales, which is shown by the this green colour there, and the SNP, Scottish National Party in Scotland. Now, why Plaid Cymru aren't so important other than the fact that they, and this is a real challenge for the left wing in the UK. So the left wing in the UK not only is split three way there, but locally in, say, Scotland and Wales, they are split uh, another two ways. So in Scotland, you would have the SNP uh, probably sitting somewhere like uh, that. I don't know. <sighs> you could argue. And and the same would be said about Plaid Cymru, right? So 
what that means is in, before reform came along, so reform's only just really been a thing. Yes, UKIP was a bit and then it went away. You had the right wing was rep rep represented by one single party, the Conservative Party. And the left wing, depending on where you were, was split by four parties. So in Scotland, it was the SNP, Labour, uh, Liberal Democrats and Greens. And in Wales, it was Plaid Cymru, Labour, Liberal Democrats and Greens. What that means is if you're sitting, if you're on the left in the UK, it's, it's much more, it's much less likely that you're going to get a candidate voted because you will have your, the left have, has its vote split four way. And as a result, Conservatives go, thank you very much. So if you think about first past the post, this is super important. You've got 10% uh, for that party, 10% uh, uh, for that party, 20% for that party, uh, and 20 cent for that party, and then 40% for Conservatives, they get in. Because all these guys split the left's vote. And that means that in order to get in in the UK as an outright Labour, assuming Labour is the traditional left wing um, party in what used to be a more of a two party system, in order for Labour to get in, they have, uh, and this is admitted even now in this, what could be a landslide election, they have a mountain to climb. So they have to overcome having their vote massively split. And they also have to overcome uh, that the fact, and this is a fact, that the right generally control the media in the UK. So there's only two left-leaning newspapers, the tabloid, the mirror, which has not a very big national uh, readership, much more up north where the sun is, say, banned in Liverpool because of the Hillsborough disaster. Um, and and I won't go into that, but the mirror is your kind of left wing tabloid up there or is your tabloid up there. And it just so happens to be left wing. Uh, and then you have The Guardian, which is very small readership, your you know, middle class intellectual type thing, right? Your elitist kind of newspaper could be seen as. And that's it. There's no other printed journal printed newspapers for the left. There is the independent that sits in the center, maybe marginally center left, but that's now not in print. It's only online only. Then on the right, you have the Daily Mail, which is absolutely staggeringly huge. When I go into my local uh, news agents, it literally is a pile of them that is taller than my head on a Sunday. And there is one or maybe two Observer, which is a Guardian Sunday newspaper. It's literally, that's, that's, it's a massive readership. So the Daily Mail, in fact, it was the biggest online news outlet in the world, the Daily Mail. Uh, I don't know if it still is, but it certainly was. So it's huge. The Daily Mail, uh, the Daily Express, which is those two are very sort of overtly on the right wing. Then you have the Daily Telegraph as a broadsheet. You have the, um, the Times. You have the Financial Times, which is kind of centre, centre right, but in, interesting. The Financial Times is a bit, a little bit all over the place. You have the Spectator. You have the Evening Standard. You have uh, the Sun, of course, the Sun, the biggest tabloid newspaper. If you're not including the Mail as tabloid, so all of those are right leaning, right? And they have a massive readership, which means that the right broadly control with very few people as well so it's murdoch um uh the um lord what's his face rob me or whatever uh you have few people controlling the media landscape on the right which has most of the readership and you have very small leadership for the left and the vote is split so the messaging is compromised and the mechanisms are compromised now this is not me being pro-left or pro-right this is me just telling you how it is so that the, the left have a very difficult time getting into power in the UK. And they usually have to do it if there's a landslide election where the, the, the right are deeply unpopular. So now let's look at the polls. This is, again, general election, but it's going to feed into the local election sense because I think the local elections were actually a, a kind of mini general election. And then we're going to see what that means going forward. So here we see that for a long time now, Labour has been trouncing the, the Conservatives in the polls. There's a few interesting things to note here. One, if this was a general election, yeah, Labour would be in a really good position. But they are being helped massively by reform. So if you remember, reform are sitting here. And for the first time in a long time, it possibly ever, 
And I'll tell you why. Because even though reform is a new iteration of the Brexit part, uh, of, of UKIP and the Brexit party, they actually took a lot of people from the left. So they took working class left voters. So a lot of the working class, if you, you look about education levels, you look about, um, if you look into uh, the correlation between education levels and uh, wages and all, all sorts of stuff and who voted for Brexit, there's a very strong correlation between um, so it's particularly working class and, edu uh, and uh, lower education levels and voting for Brexit. And so what happened is Brexit, the UKIP party took a lot of Labour voters. So although it sat there, you could argue in, traditionally in a kind of spectrum of, of politics, it actually took a load of left, uh, what would have been traditional left wing kind of union or uh, working class voters and took them over to the populist right. And you could argue that's what's happened in the US as well over time as the Rust Belt has been neglected and the old school union voters have been attracted to the Trumpian populism. And that is what now the Democratic Party is having to having to deal with is trying to get those people back, um, to those traditional old school Democratic voters, really, really similar. And so the, 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 the Conservative part vote has never been split. Now, this year, reform is taking on an anti-woke populist kind of vote, positioning, but they aren't, you're starting to see Brexit voters go back to Labour, interestingly. And so the reform voters are being seen to take the vote from the Conservatives. So when you see this downward trend of the Conservative Party here, it correlates with an upwards trend of reform. And it's not affected Labour too much. And we'll come on and look at this in a couple of uh, key elections. Liberal Democrats have been fairly consistent. Greens have been consistent. SNP, the Scottish National Party, have been uh, in a bit of trouble. OK, so uh, we're going to go back to Scotland to explain how important Scotland is for Labour getting in or not. So out of the 650 constituencies in the UK, remember, you have to get 325 to get a majority government. Labour used to basically be in control of almost the entirety of Scotland. If you go back sort of 30 years, this would have been all red. And then suddenly it happened really quickly. But the SNP, the Scottish National Party, with their nationalist agenda, got really, really popular. They, this used to this used to be a guaranteed 50 plus seats. I think there are 56 seats in, in Scotland. And Labour used to get around 50 seats. So when you're talking about 326 to get voted in as a majority government, 50 of those would have come if you were Labour from Scotland, which means you only have to find 275 now. And so in the, the rest of the country, which would be England, because we're going to forget Northern Ireland because they don't really have any of those parties. You're thinking from Wales and England, I need to find 275 uh, MPs. But now, as you can see, there is a single Labour constituency. I think there's only one. And that means that you now no longer have 50. So you now have to, instead of get, getting 275 uh, MPs in England and Wales, you have to now find 326 or 325 MPs. That makes it even more difficult for Labour to get in. So if you're talking about a left-wing government in the UK, there are now three difficulties. Well, this is part of the, the split the vote difficulty, to be honest. So this is, this is a manifestation of the vote being split, but it, it is the idea that the SNP just are that prevalent in Scotland. However, they've just gone through a massive set of controversies, including Nicola Sturgeon's husband. So she was the previous leader of the SNP, and her husband has been arrested or, or he's being investigated for... Um, some issues to do with funding and uh, the SNP and so on and so forth. Uh, and the SNP leader has just stepped down, I do believe, as well. So this is a perfect time for Labour to possibly fight back in Scotland. OK, so hopefully that gives you an idea of where we are at with regard to the, the general election, how our electoral system works and what the challenges are for the Labour to get in against uh, 
against the Conservatives. Uh, the two-party system in the US, which is... So what's happened in the UK is we have now started moving, but it takes such a lot of effort to move from a two-party system where actually it used to be kind of Conservatives, Labour, and a little bit of Lib Dem. So, But it was broadly a two-party system. You either voted Tory or Labour. We've now moved to a bit of a, a, a more pluralistic landscape but it takes a heck of a lot of hard work and it's really difficult for these parties now in the us it's just it's you're still in the impossible state you need electoral reform in order to have proper representation of your elect uh, electorate because you think of any third party are they ever going to get to to be a president no our third party candidates voted in as senators or representatives in, in the house of representatives very rarely and then they end up pretty much caucusing with one party or the other so for example there are 51 senators in the us who who are effectively democrats and 49 who are republicans but of the 51 who are democrats three are actually independents and caucus with the democrats bernie sanders being the famous one there uh, but he he is he's to the left so he's always going to vote for the um for the Democrats. Right. Just before we go into local elections, the last thing I'm going to say about the spectrum, and this is super important, and this is, this is, and this is why I mentioned the American system. So in a, in a strict two party system, so imagine you've got the American system where the colors are different in America. So the left wing is blue and the right wing is red. But, but um, if you are only have two parties, if you are far, far, so if you're a progressive left candidate in, you know, a voter in America, you are never, ever going to vote for a Republican. And if you are far right, like MAGA Republican, you are never ever going to vote for Democrats because they are they are just the evil. So what that should mean is that both parties should be fighting over the center ground because you've got in the bag your extremes. They're never going to vote for the other side. So don't bother thinking about policies that are going to make them super happy. You can almost ignore them. They're going to vote for you anyway. This is Trump's mistake. He's courting the far right and he's not courting the center. And this is why I think uh, um, this is why I think Biden will win. Partly, there's lots of reasons I think he's, he will win. But the longer Trump talks about the extreme and talks about like full on abortion bans and strict abortion bans, blah, blah, blah. He will, he will, he's cozying up these people. They love it. They are absolutely shat. And the, the reason he loves that is because they all tell him how wonderful he is. And he's very easily... Um, manipulated by public opinion like that but strategically you should be going for the center so bill clinton famously had focus groups who went around the nation and said you are all the swing voters in the center who sometimes vote this way and sometimes vote that way what do you what do you want what would you like in the next election what manifesto would you like what would you vote for and they said this 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 and this yeah thank you very much i'm going to take all those ideas and we're going to whack that in our manifesto and he got voted in as part of the reason why he, Bill Clinton, had a successful campaign. Now, Tony Blair in 1997 took that on for the UK, said, oh, that was really clever, that. And Tony Blair did the same thing, went out and had loads of focus groups, worked out what everyone wanted in the centre, and then put that in a manifesto. And he drew the Labour Party back to the centre. But at the time, you could afford to do that because you didn't have parties at the other end of the spectrum because your far left in in back in 1997 were always going to vote Labour and your far right were always going to vote Tory. So you fought over the centre ground. Now, what's interesting now about the UK elections, not the American elections. So the Americans should still be trying to strategize over the centre. Should absolutely be if you want to get into power, that's what you do. In the UK, that is now no longer the case. So we look at here, the Conservatives are being torn. They know they need to go for the centre. But if they go for the centre, then they lose the extreme vote to reform. And reform go, you're not being anti-woke enough, so we're going to vote for reform. So then, so you've what you've had is people like Rishi Sunak listening to advisors or, or listening to maybe politicians like Suella Braverman who are saying we need to be more hardcore. We need to send all our immigrants off to Rwanda. We need to do X, Y, and Z, and that's appealing to this area because they know if they don't appeal to that area, then they lose those votes to reform. 
But the problem is that by appealing to that area, they lose the centre ground to the Lib Dems and even to Labour, Ply Cymru and SNP. So that is now a challenge. That is the vote being split for Conservatives for the first time ever. And that is changing things hugely. Now, the same is the case for Labour. Uh, I would forget Lib Dems because they're kind of more centrist. But actually, no, well, it's a good point. So if Labour go to the far, further to the left, like Jeremy Corbyn did, then you will lose the centre ground to, to either Conservatives or Liberal Democrats. And indeed, you had the red wall up north, this big Labour block up north. There were, this used to be much redder around here, right? The north was a lot redder. But in the last election, they got hammered because Jeremy Corbyn went, you can argue, went to left wing, which is, you know, classic left leaning kind of a lot of the policies, interestingly, were very popular. But the perception, because, of course, the media was dead against him and statistically so, he was the most negatively reported political um, leader in UK history, statistically speaking. Really fascinating statistics on how Jeremy Corbyn was reported. Not necessarily about where he was, because there were some other interesting statistics that looked at his policies and going to places. I remember that were a BBC One programme with, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, former MP. Anyway, he went to Guildford, which is a really, really conservative neck of the woods around here, right? Went to Guildford, went around saying, do you agree with this policy? Do you agree with this policy? And all these people in Guildford, like, that's brilliant policy. That's a brilliant policy. Yep, yep, I'd vote for that. He said, you do realise that these are all the policies of Jeremy Corbyn. And all these people went, oh my God, no, no, I'm, okay, I won't do, oh my God, ah, and went absolutely, they were like, lost it because the perception of Jeremy Corbyn and the reality of Jeremy Corbyn, as in his policies were actually sound and not extreme, and people in Guildford liked his policies, but the, uh, the he was painted as some radical leftist. And as soon as they found out it was, it was Jeremy Corbyn, they were like, oh, lost the plot. So anyway, the Labour were perceived to or went further to the left. And that means they lost the centre and the Tories took the red wall up north. They took a load of northern seats that are now these more industrial towns up north that are now coming back to Labour and we'll look at that in the local elections in a second uh, but if they go too much to the centre which they are doing now so, so Keir Starmer the new Labour leader has said right we need to win so we need to go to the centre but it means that they do lose votes to the Greens who stick on the more extreme left and possibly to other parties if you're disaffected over things like Gaza and Israel because Labour have been quite pro-Israel, at least they were initially, and that has come and bit them on the arse. Right, now we go to the local elections. First thing to note is the local elections from last week. I know that's a really long intro, but this is a kind of like a UK politics 101. The, the local elections were not widespread in the UK. There was like, uh, there were 900 Labour councillors that were that were up for grabs there were 900 conservative candidates and then hundreds of other of the others right but these were not all over in, there were none in wales uh there i don't think they were they were all mainly around england and in randomly different places so it wasn't particularly huge in terms of the numbers but my, they can tell us quite a lot now the other thing to note is when you have local elections in an election year it is almost certainly the case that they are voting mainly on national um, topics rather than I want someone who's really good at filling the potholes on my roads. I want a new bus route on, uh, that's going to service me. All those kind of local things. Actually, they go a bit by the wayside. People are like... With the. There's been a lot of media ramping up the general election that's coming. There's talk about all these opinion polls uh, and people then get carried along with that and they go out and vote. I know that because that's exactly what I just did. I didn't vote on, I don't, I didn't, and I'm really politically literate, but I spend too much time talking about Ukraine. I don't, didn't know what my local candidates were particularly offering and I'm not all that sure that they uh, have massively differentiated things that they're going to try and do 
uh, outside of some top line uh, issues. So I'm more of a anyone but the Conservatives kind of guy. So I'm like, who's got the most chance? This is tactical voting. Who's got the most chance of getting voted in in my constituency? Labour, uh, Lib Dem or Greens? It turns out that none of them, there's nothing I can do to change my local constituency. And so that I'm disenfranchised. I feel there's no point in me getting... I do get up and vote. I always vote. But there is actually no point in me voting at the moment. It's just... It's a dyed-in-the-wall conservative area. Both as a larger constituency and also my ward, my small area, very locally. Insanely, uh, insanely conservative. A lot of old people live around here as well. Anyway, so that, that was all down here. Right, so not many... We're up for grabs. But remember the numbers, 900 odd for the uh, previously were Labour, 900 odd were Conservatives. And the Conservatives were, I think, the biggest uh, out of the ones seats that were up for grabs had, had the biggest proportion. And these were the results. I think they're pretty much all counted now. So Labour gained 186. Lib Dems gained 104. Tories, the Conservatives, lost 474. Independence gained 93. That's a key number there. Uh, Greens gained 74. That's a massive number, and we're going to talk about that. Interestingly, Reform, who are polling at about 13% at the moment, but because of first past the post, got, so this is Reform over here, got, Z oh no, I think they got two candidates. It, so they did get some candidates. Um, sorry, uh, they did get two, but it's not big enough to to put on here. Now, when we talk about the media, what's fascinating, we're going to listen to an interview in a second. Reform and Richard Tice got massive amounts of media coverage, massive amounts, like huge amounts of media coverage compared to the Greens. The Greens got, for these local council elections, almost zero, almost zero media coverage. The Greens have 181 seats out of the ones that were just up for grabs and Reform got two seats. That is 90 times the seats that Reform got, the Greens got, and yet they got probably a 20th of the media. And that is absolutely disgusting. So I just want to put that out there. I'm not advocating greens. I'm advocating fairness. Right? And our media landscape absolutely um, benefits either the main parties or divisive parties like UKIP used to get loads. Uh, Nigel Farage was on Question Time 33 times and complained that the, the, the BBC were always pro-left. And he's got the most representation on their flagship political channel, political, political show by Country Mile. And Caroline Lucas, who's an amazing, the one green MP, not local councillor, one main, one green MP, Caroline Lucas, who I think is just brilliant. Like she's always on point in everything she says, was, uh, didn't feature nearly enough. And she was an elected MP and Nigel Farage wasn't. He was just the leader of the UKIP party. He was not an elected MP. And they got zero MPs. And yet the, the, the amount of media time and space they're afforded is phenomenal. So that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is that the Conservatives were saying, if we, get, if we lose more than 400 seats, it is catastrophic. So they lost almost 500 seats. So we're talking about the bad end of catastrophic. But when you look at Labour, actually, they didn't gain those seats. They gained a lot of them. But over half of them went to other places like the Lib Dems, like the Independents and like the Greens. So that's something to note. Now, what is very interesting is that if you look at, so um, these are the councils. So the Labour gained eight councils, Liberal Democrats gained two councils, which means that sitting on a council, you have all these seats and the, the councils, councillors that, that were voted in and out and whatnot changed the, the, the makeup of, of the, each council where these seats were up for grabs. And sometimes it was only a few council seats that were up for grabs, but it changed the majority and, and you had some councils swapping hands there. But um, essentially you had very often it was reform 
that were taking the votes away from the Conservatives that allowed Labour to come in. So what we saw from these general elections, and there was one by-election, a by-election is an election that takes place out of sync from the normal general election when someone is is retired or has died or has health issues or has been like sacked or investigated or whatever. And we had uh, the Blackpool by-election and that was Conservative. So this is one of these northern places that had gone Conservative and then went back to being Labour. But the difference between the Labour and the Conservative vote was, broadly speaking, the reform vote. So had the Reform Party not existed, Labour might not have got back in. Which is to say, so when we look at the local elections going forward, and although there are no Reform uh, councillors on here, they only got two, the Reform vote shows us that if they field candidates, and there's arguments as to whether they are going to field candidates in every constituency or how many constituencies or are they going to take a step back because if they field candidates, the reality is the Tories will dip out. So reform are essentially going to allow a potential Labour victory or the certainty of the general election is that the Conservatives, in my opinion, will not win. And you would assume, therefore, Labour are going to win. But actually, you can see two, two scenarios that, that, that can kind of screw Labour. One scenario is reform don't do stuff. I don't know. They do a deal with the Conservatives where they don't fill those candidates. And then all these people add on to their. And that means that although the national uh, here, that the national polling might still put the Conservatives behind Labour, when you go back to understanding the first past the post voting system, you can still have, which is exactly what happened for the last, uh, well, the last two Republican victories. So wasn't it Hillary Clinton had more popular vote than Donald Trump? And if we go back to the Bush Gore uh, vote as well. You have the situation where you can have more votes, but if they're not in the right place, you can lose the presidential election, for example. Well, it's the kind of same here. So so you could you could have Labour getting screwed over, even though they're ahead in the polls, because of the way the makeup of first past the post and messaging and the right places, etc. etc. So the uh the reform party have a big big role to play in the coming elections. Now, the other thing is Gaza Israel. So what you had in the local elections just now is a number of northern seats. So in the north of the UK, you have a number of cities that are that have high levels of Muslim uh, voters that you've got a lot of Islamic communities in so Bradford, Leeds, Birmingham particularly, um, you know, so a lot of these northern cities uh, and you can go into sort of Oldham, Bolton, or, or a lot of cities up around here. And Gaza is a really big thing. And you've had someone like George Galloway who's come, come around and he's starting up a new party and he just got voted in in a recent by-election that really should have gone to Labour, but it went to him. He split the... He, he, well, he, he won that, but he won it on Gaza, Israel. So if you have large proportions or, or comparatively large proportions of Muslim voters in these northern communities who are being driven by Gaza, Israel, then you might get a situation where the Labour vote is, is hammered from that angle and it splits Labour so that someone else gets in. That is a real challenge for Keir Starmer. So as I say, like you want to go towards the centre traditionally to get the votes. But actually, Keir Starmer's got a number of different things going on where he's, a, remember, the leader of the, um, of the Labour Party, which means... So what happened in the local elections is that people voted on national issues, international issues even. And you had local councillors that were voted in for the Greens as protest votes against Keir Starmer's pro-Israel positioning so you had some 
it appears some so northern Muslim voters and young voters as well, uh, idealistic voters, student voters in a lot of places. Newcastle was a place where you got some green um, councillors. Uh, so if we go back to the uh, the map here, Newcastle up here, you had some um, green councillors getting voted in up there on the basis that, that they were heavily student areas and they will favour the anti-Israel pro-Palestine stance. And if Keir Starmer doesn't think carefully about where his positioning is, he will lose out uh, to those uh, attacks from essentially uh, the left. So there's a there are some some real caveats to what's going to go on with the with the general election. But you can see that Labour. I think if this had been a similar sort of situation thirty years ago, Labour would have put, picked up most of those conservative seats. But instead, we had Lib Dems picking up. Uh, independence picking up and I can bet you that many of those independents would have been Gaza uh, people concerned with uh, with Gaza and Israel and the Greens as well and the Greens did did very very well indeed the other thing that's really worth noting here is to show you how bad it is the Lib Dems just on these particular seats that were up for grabs but this is a reflection of how the nation is feeling the Lib Dems came in second. They got more councillors voted in than the Conservatives. So this could be an absolutely fascinating general election coming up where you've got many parties vying for, obviously vying for power, but you've got a situation where you've got some of these parties, SNP, Plaid Cymru, Greens, Labour, uh, Lib Dems are all fighting for many of the same voters. There's been this call for many years for what's called a progressive alliance. And a progressive alliance is that particularly Greens, SNP and Labour get together and say, right, we're going to look at a, a Tory, um, a Tory usually safe seat, someone like West Dorset, right? And we're going to say, right, that votes, uh, that votes Conservative. Who are the who's the best threat to them? Is it Lib Dems, Labour, or Greens? Who are most likely to be voted in after Conservatives? Okay, let's say it's Lib Dems. A Progressive Alliance would say that the Labour candidate or the Labour Party and the Green Party would say in West Dorset, we are not going to field a candidate or we're not going to promote our candidate. They'll stand as a kind of like you know puppet candidate or whatever we will essentially endorse the Lib Dems in West Dorset. Um, and what that means is they tactically get together so that in lots of key constituencies, you say, right, in Bristol, Labour and Lib Dems are going to stand aside and Greens are going to run because they've got the highest chance of getting voted in in Bristol, in one of the Bristol um, constituencies. And then that gives, you then don't split the vote because they know that their vote, everyone's known for a long time that the left gets split. So there's been this call for um, progressive alliance, but the, the main, well, it's mainly Labour say, no, they kind of have too much pride and say, no, we're going to run a candidate in every constituency, obviously, because we're like the main opposition or we're the main party if we're, if we're ruling. We're not going to, we don't need to lower ourselves to do a progressive alliance. And as a result, they get, they get hit every election. It should definitely have been a progressive alliance in every single general election for the last 20 years, in my opinion. So that's kind of what's going on there. We are going to now play uh, an interview on, or part of an interview on LBC. We've got Matthew Wright talking to the deputy leader of the Green Party. He's already had some interesting things to say, but we, go, we won't go into that. This is just a little bit on proportional representation. I wouldn't say they're the two major parties anymore. I'd say they're the two old parties, the two historic parties. And actually, it's parties like the Green Party that are really the future. Where do you, where do you foresee the fortunes of the Green Party being in a general election scenario? Because our democracy, as we've been talking about over the last couple of hours, it is far from perfect. 
Absolutely. And um, the first pass for post uh, voting system is without a doubt a broken voting system, which isn't just bad for the Green Party, but it's actually much worse for the entire population because it means people are made are forced to make difficult choices. That all being said, these election results have demonstrated time and time again that even under a first pass for post voting system, the Green Party can and do win. So what we're doing at the next election is hyper focusing in particular on four target seats. That's Brighton, where we already hold yeah. it, and Sean Berry is looking yep. to take over, Bristol Central, North Herefordshire, and Waveney Valley. There's lots of other places we'll be working hard in too, but those are the four where we're looking to go from can one MP to four Green MPs to hold a future Labour government to account. Can I, can I ask, do you, do you feel frustrated that reform gobbles up all the, the TV and, and media space, Tice is on every programme, every political programme I see all the time, and, and his little acolytes... And it's, it's, it's a rare day I see a, a, a Green spokesperson uh, being uh, being treated with the same sort of s respect and same sort of op being given the same sort of opportunity. And, so and without blowing smoke, I just think it's fundamentally unfair the way the media is, 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 is back to a party reform or given more airtime to a party that hasn't re translated into votes. And in fact, if we're looking at votes, we, we did the Greens a great disservice, the mainstream media. I'd say it's worse than frustrating. I'd say it's sinister how often Richard Tice and Reform Party have been platformed. And we've seen the script before. It happened with Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party, where there was a media uh, story that constantly pushed this kind of right-wing agenda, even when the country wasn't talking about it and people weren't interested. Now, I will give credit to LBC. I've been on LBC lots, and I hope to continue to be. But actually, the amount that Reform was mentioned, particularly on the BBC yesterday, mm. despite the fact I think there were two councillors, they might be at three councillors now. Two, I think, two. Compared to the 800 councillors and growing that the Green Party have got, my own London Assembly election for today, I really hope to hold my seat. You know, Just to let you know, so these were the 181 that they won in this round of um, local elections, but they have over 800 nationally. So if you all these white areas that weren't up for grabs, they had there are Green councillors there, and yet they got a, a minuscule fraction of the media coverage that Reform got, and Reform with all that media coverage, get two councillors. It's just massively unfair. These are serious positions where we're holding serious positions of authority as well as uh, running the majority council in Mid-Suffolk. And so the fact that we're so often cut out of the media narrative, I'd say it doesn't matter that it's frustrating. It's fundamentally undemocrat undemocratic Sorry. for voters who oh, should sorry. see that there is an alternative to the failed authority of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party that's refusing to oppose. And that's not just on local issues, by the way. That's on those big international issues. We were the first party to consistently call for a ceasefire and a release you of are. hostages and to ban uh, arms trades to Israel. But for a long time in the media, there was no kind of sense that a party was calling for that. I now, agree. that would seem like a radical position a few months ago. I'd say it's much more of a mainstream position now. But when the Green Party cut out of this, these conversations, what it actually does is water down our democracy well, see, and I, pushes I, into a very small, narrow box. I completely uh, concur. Uh, if you wouldn't mind staying there, because I want to bring in Catherine Mayer, if I may, co-founder and president of the Women's Equality Party. And, uh, and I'm sure she's been listening very keenly to everything you've just said. Good morning to you, Catherine. Catherine, lovely to speak to you. Good morning, both of you. Um, and I've not only been listening keenly, but I've been nodding vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> So again, a smaller party that's like we and they got uh, a councillor in themselves and they are just are not part of the narrative at all. I think so. A party standard started by Sandy Toxvig. Anyway, so there are there are so many things to consider. But I think Israel Gaza is going to be very interesting for both Biden and uh, the Democrats in the US November elections and also the elections being held in the UK whenever they may be. All the parties are going to have to think very carefully. There's a long time between now and those elections, no doubt. And I think, hope, hope for, well, I don't want to give my own opinion, but from a, a Labour point of view, they will be saying, hopefully there's enough time that, that Israel will sort itself out and actually won't be top of people's agenda in November. Um, and with Biden, he had to come out and make a speech recently, which I thought was pretty good. He did a really good job of that really complex situation and talking to everyone and talking to every position 
in a, in a neutral enough kind of way. I thought he did a really good job there. But he knows that that's super challenging for the for the for the Democrats, and he would be hoping that Gaza and Israel sort of calms itself down, and there's a solution that's at least somewhat on the way before November, because that could bite them, uh, the Democrats on the butt in in the November elections in the same way that it showed itself in the local elections here. Um, really interesting. I mean, there were mayoral elections here as well, and the Tories got uh, pretty much hammered apart from one, uh, uh, which they held on. And interestingly, yeah, that guy didn't have any conservative symbolism on his literature. So th there's the oak tree, the blue and the green as part of the, as the logo, conservative logo. He he didn't, he changed the whole color, color scheme. And basically he ran as like, it's Halcham. He ran as a, uh, as not a a conservative particularly. He ran he, on his own personality and his own uh, you know name recognition and whatnot. And he got voted back in as a mayor uh, for one of these no northern areas. But, uh, but otherwise, the Conservatives really got a hammering in the local elections. So th what this means is that you will almost certainly not have a Conservative government in November. I know someone had a go at me for saying, stop being so forthright on the fact on on the claim that of what will happen in november just all the indicators are that the conservatives are going to be in trouble yes it will narrow up but on the latest mrp polling which is constituency by constituency polling the conservatives were going to be left with under 100 mps which would be reducing them. I mean, people are talking about what happened to the Canadians back in when, uh, was it the Liberal Party? No, which party was it that got reduced? I think it might be the Conservative Party reduced to like two candidates in one election. And they were the, they were the majority party at one point. So it, it won't be that bad for, for the Conservatives. They're just too, there are too many people who are always going to vote for what they vote for in the UK. I know that because my my parents are, are two of them. Um, so, you know, I, I I think it will close up. But when you start looking at these results, like this is about as bad as, as you could have predicted it to have been for the Conservatives. You've got a number of parties that are picking up the pieces. And the big question is, how much will the Labour Party, how much will the Labour vote be split between Lib Dems and Greens? And how much will the independents or, or maybe Greens take from the Labour vote in terms of issues like Israel-Gaza. Those are your challenges for the left or for Labour, really. And the challenges for, to, for the right or for the Conservatives are reform. What do reform do? Uh, because I think they could be not so much the king makers, but the, the king breakers. So reform, I, I think... Ha hold the key to the downfall of the Conservatives if they run in uh, in a number of or in, in as many constituencies as they can. But what you might start getting is a move towards uh, people wanting another AV referendum to get proportional representation because you might get no reform politicians voted in but a huge vote for them, you might get 13 point, if they are polling at 13.5%, you can still see them not getting a single MP, which means that it is deeply unfair because, you know, 13.5% of the vote gives you an awful lot of MPs. I mean, 10% of MPs is 65 MPs. Um, so, yeah, say from there, it's going to be, it's going to be, interesting to see how people react if that does uh, happen but you might also get a a, a a a more permanently changed political landscape in the uk we might get to a position where the conservatives aren't to be that major party that sits on the right uh unthreatened by anyone else it could be now that the right looks like the left in terms of being split and this will be better for the UK in general not in terms of like oh the right won't just continue getting voted in because I'm not I'm anti-right or something but in terms of representation it will be better it, the more parties you have the more likely you are to have a party that better better reflects who you are 
Now, the challenges are that if you, the more parties you get, the more your vote is split and the, and the more chaotic coalitions become. So there's probably a sweet spot between like a million parties and two parties. Where is that sweet spot? I don't know. But, but certainly the way it's been in the UK, there needs to be reform. And I'd argue that the US has one of the worst democratic political systems because it is the least single least representative obviously so like if you're a voter with all your different views you might be like i am pro-life i hate abortion but i also hate i'm pro-life and i hate guns people are having guns on the streets and so, but there's nothing that represents that for me so i have to throw my vote in with either the republicans or the democrats and they don't really ref they reflect half of who i am like Obviously, I'm talking about, I'm used two, two issues there, but multiply that out. The US, you are put into one pot or another, and it is deeply unrepresentative. And I, I, like many people, are screaming for electoral reform there. The electoral college system, I know that people say it's got its advantages, but it definitely needs reforming. You've got um, undemocratic situations with you know senators uh, compared to populations uh, compared to representatives the other thing you get with first past the post is the importance of um borders and gerrymandering so in the u.s because where the votes take place it is you're not represented like your vote isn't just counted as as a proportion of the national vote it's like it takes place here my vote and it's all about my local constituency and therefore if we change the borders here then that can manipulate who gets voted in so in the u.s gerrymandering is such a big problem and it's a problem that is exacerbated by first past post voting system we have that to a degree in the uk there are redistricting issues that are taking place but it's it's not to the same degree at all as it is in the us anyway that's my uh tuppence on what is going on in the local elections this was a, a very good night for labor it was a good night for lib dems it was a very good night for greens and it was a catastrophic night for the conservatives RA, by the way, means a residence association. Um, but uh, what it is, what it means going forward, it still depends on a number of variables, not least Israel Gaza. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that was of use. Take care. Speak soon.